Hi, my name is Piyush Sabarwal. I'm a nuclear engineer. I work at Idaho National Lab. And today I'll be talking on microreactors. Um, as the title says, small but mighty and reaching out for a better future. So before we begin, uh, I'll go into too much de uh, depth here. I have a video that I'd like to show, which kind of talks about advanced reactors in general. Like, why do we need them? So let me see. So with that, um, before I begin, I would like to, like to put out a disclaimer. Um, you know, like right now, I'm representing just myself. So the opinions, findings, conclusion, recommendations are all mine and did not necessarily reflect the views of Department of Energy of Office of Nuclear Energy or Idaho National Lab in any manner. So I just want to make sure that that's out and clear before I go forward. So I have structured this presentation, um, you know, in this manner. So I'll spend just briefly a few minutes on the nuclear history, nuclear reactor involvement uh, benefits, because I understand there might be uh, some folks here who, are, who don't have the nuclear background, which is totally fine. So then I'll talk about motivations. Anytime we do any research or work, what is the motivation behind it? What is the main objective that you want to accomplish? Then I'll talk about, then I'll get deeper into micro reactors. We'll talk about DOE nuclear, nuclear engineering micro reactor program in general, and then talk about what, what are we doing? How is the distributive AVR? What is the path forward? Um, ongoing work, and then sum it up with some main conclusions. So, so, so this is our 80 year past in shaping the nuclear energy future. As you can see, uh, the Chicago pile was the first human made self sustaining nuclear chain reaction in 1942. Then, right here in EBR1, December 20, 1951, mm -hmm. um, basically, we showed uh, that we can produce electricity. And this ARCO, then we had a lot of facilities that got built, 1963, 1973, which was the loft facility, which led to, um, in fact, uh, there's a big thermal hydraulics code that is commonly used in nuclear industry called RELAP-5. Uh, that basically came from there. Then we had 1986 EBR-2 and so forth. And now we are working in arena of um, advanced test reactor, VTR, uh, that we are currently working on. And uh, one thing I want to point out that uh, the treat, which was established in 1959, we just recently in 2018 restarted the treat, so which has been going uh, really good, and uh, we've been accomplishing the goals that we planned for. So that has been a success. Um, this is how the nuclear power has evolved from generation one to two to three to three plus and four. And uh, basically, all I want to get from this slide, I know it's a busy slide, is basically as you went from generation one to two to three, three plus and four. We have been <clears throat> targeting more and more passive safety features. So basically not depending on human interface, human uh, uh, coming in and helping the accident scenarios, but basically uh, passive safety that we can depend upon to resolve the issues. We've been looking at uh, making sure the reactors are safer, sustainable, economical, and certainly more proliferation resistant. So this basically divides the same thing as I brought up about uh, different reactor categories. In generation four, we have gas cooled fast reactor, lead cooled fast reactor, molten salt fast reactor, sodium fast reactor, supercritical super water cooled reactor, and very high temperature reactor, which is again a gas reactor in thermal spectrum. So, what are the key benefits? Why even we care about nuclear power? Uh, the big benefits that I see is, <clears throat> of course, the environmental benefits, you know, to negligible emissions compared to the alternate sources we have. Base load power, which has very high capacity factor about 90 to 92% capability to provide constant power and being very resilient. Uh, that said, I also want to point out that, you know, I still strongly believe in a proper energy diversity, like all of the above policy, all energy mix, because I really see each um, power generating source has its own value. So basically it has to be a good complete mix. And which would um, also, we got to look into non-proliferation going forward uh, when you talk about these advanced reactors. For the one of the questions that I, you know, comes across is about the cost. So as you can see in different technologies out there like coal, natural gas, and so forth, we have fuel costs as the major component. Like for coal, it's like 78% and O&M, which is operation maintenance, 22%. For nuclear, it's O&M is 66% and fuel is 34%, which is further subdivided in the last... Um, Plot, last histogram there. So, you know, few things looking at 
where are we today and how do we achieve energy independence and how we make sure we are more resilient. You know, uh, as a clean energy source, there are ways to integrate nuclear with renewable. We call integrated energy system where nuclear and renewable can be coupled or integrated with each other yeah, because renewable only depends on location. Like, you know, when wind, and wind doesn't blow and sun doesn't shine, we can still rely on nuclear to meet the robust uh, energy need. Then we have advanced nuclear that I'm going to talk today about, small module reactors and micro reactors, which are going to be like more uh, acceptable and more flexible, at, depending. Flexibility means adhering to the market changes. So far, nuclear industry has primarily been a um, constant power source, meaning not load following, just being like a base level plant. But this one, we can have flexibility to it so we can make sure we can adapt to the changing market. And I think that's very important. Um, so this is the market that advanced nuclear can really play in going forward. This is just an example to show how nuclear plant can be integrated with renewable energy source. Here I have example on the right of solar and wind. Of course, we since they have two different energy medium with different uh, inertia uh, and time scales, we need energy storage to take care of the perturbations. But it can it can we can do this and uh, meet our need and also supply. Uh, additional uh, power in terms of electricity or thermal energy to generate other byproducts, not just electricity, but also like hydrogen production. The lowest part on the diagram that you see is basically high temperature stream electrolysis, which requires both electricity and uh, heat that we can meet. So say, for instance, we are meeting the demand um, for a given market. So excess could be transferred to another plant, which could be co-located to generate a product as such as uh, either synthetic fuel production, hydrogen production, or even desal, desalination plant. Um, there was a study, then comes the motivation, why we look into these things. So there was a study jointly done between uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, and INL a few years back, where we looked at top 14 industries. We said, okay, how much emission is really coming from industry sector? So this basically is in the older plot from 2014, but the key thing is that 21% is, is being generated from industry. And then that is further subdivided into the plot next to it by stationary combustion or non-energy use and fossil fuel systems. So if you know, once you look deeper into this industry, we saw, okay, there's a lot of heat requirement in this industry to make sure either we for drying purposes or for um, some robust clean purposes, but there's a lot of heat being utilized. And for that, they uh, combusting natural gas. So these are the top 14 industries that basically um, are currently in US based on the emission. So we looked at all these 14 and tried to understand how much metric ton of CO2 do they produce. This is how they're located at in different part of US. Um, I said, these are like alkaline and chlorine, ethyl, um, ethyl alcohol, iron and steel, lime, fertilizer, paper and paperboard and so forth. So for example, I'm just using one industrial example today, paper and paper board. This is a consumption on a daily basis. So this is how much pulp is used, like 2000 tam metric tons per day, amount of steam required, electricity required, and water required for a nominal plant. So what I mean by nominal is there would be some plant which would be beyond that capacity and some would be under, but a nominal plant, average plant in this industry almost emits 36 kilotons per day of CO2 emissions for, you know, when they produce 347 tons per day of paper and 600, ton, 600 tons per day of paperboard. So we looked in that deeper. Okay, so what sort of requirement can we meet? So, you know, if you look at this process diagram, you see I have electricity and steam mentioned. So, and then steam could be of different quality of steam. So low pressure steam, medium pressure stream, high pressure stream which talks about the quality. It depends on the temperature and pressure, as you can see, which is given the lower left-hand side. So this is where we think that instead of burning natural gas to produce the heat, we can use an SMR or micro reactor to meet that need, which would take care, which would certainly reduce the emissions uh, produced by this industry. This slide just sums it up about the heat and steam, heat, steam and electricity that a micro reactor SMR can generate. And these are potential industries. There are more industries out there, but these are just, I'm just showing that we can, you know, basically meet the need as they need both heat and electricity uh, for the production. So, <clears throat> so now I'm going to go into the micro reactors. 
for microreactors, when we define microreactors, typically uh, we talk about an energy system which is less than 20 megawatt thermal. So around eight to 10 megawatt electric. What are the key attributes, right? So what defines as microreactor? So we want a microreactor, which is, of course, I talked about the power source already, like less than 20 megawatt thermal, easily transportable, uh, flexible operation, uh, lifetime around five to 20 years, which can support remote communities, isolated microgrids, mining sites, and certainly DOD applications. There are four microreactors, primarily, gas cool microreactor, molten salt cool microreactor, liquid metal cool reactor. When I say liquid metal, I mean sodium, um, sodium cooled or lead cooled uh, reactor. And then we have heat pipe cooled reactor. So heat pipe cooled reactor means we are using heat pipe, which is another thermal, passive thermal device to take it, you know, to transport the heat from the reactor uh, to either power conversion unit or to another heat sink. So in this, in the DOE micro reactor R&D program, the main mission is to enable the technology demonstrate a DOE national lab and subsequent deployment for commercial or defense application. This microactor program is further subdivided into three different areas. First area is system integration analysis area. This is uh, led by a colleague of mine, Dr. Green, uh, Dr. Uh, Scott Greenwood at Oak Ridge National Lab. This area primarily looks at economics, market analysis, integrated system analysis, techno-economic analysis, and regulatory development. So it's very, very important because uh, while we develop or demonstrate technology to make sure we understand the market, we understand the economics, and we have simultaneous or parallel effort going in towards meeting the regulatory needs. Most of the structure out there currently in NRC is focused on um, light water react technology. And now we're talking about advanced air technology. So there are some advancements, some modification which needs to be made. And uh, so that program talks to NRC on a regular basis and help meet those needs, uh, support that program. Next thing is technology maturation. So as you can imagine, we have uh, for these reactors, there will be a lot of uh, advancement needed. Uh, so one-off things, which is not available on the shelf, advanced heat pipe, moderators, um, and so forth. So that or instrumentation and sensors development to understand and monitor these technologies. That is led by a colleague, colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Holly Chulu at Los Alamos National Lab. And the third technology area is demonstration support capabilities in which we have non-nuclear uh, test beds and nuclear test beds. Uh, this area is, um, I'm, I'm the lead on this at Idaho National Lab. And uh, we all three work together to make sure uh, that we meet the mission needs of the DOE Microactor Program and are able to successfully demonstrate and deploy microreactor in the next uh, three to five years. This basically just uh, talks about, I already just talked about. Um, and then I'm just kind of quickly go through the different areas. So as I mentioned, system integration, we're looking at economic and market analysis. This becomes very important um, because as you can imagine, uh, market plays a big role. So we look at techno-economics, not only looking at technical feasibility, but market. Does we Do we have a market for this? What do we need to have a market? What are the competitors? Um, so we look into all those things. And then we work with the other DOE programs like NEMS, which develop, which main purpose is to develop codes to support these advanced reactors. So we work with them in hand in hand. And of course we work with NRC, which is the regulatory body to ensure that uh, we are meeting and keeping them informed so uh, they can make changes and advancement uh, in their policy making. Uh, Regulatory aspects, we are working INL and Oak Ridge are engaging in combined effort to develop a regulatory research plan for microreactors. As I said, these are new technologies uh, and a lot of things have only been shown or proven uh, using a code or modeling tool, which is essential, but to get to the next step, we need to make sure we are able to demonstrate it. So, um, you know, get the data to gain regulators confidence and uh, you know, support the regulatory work. So that, that goes into this area. Further thing we are looking into is autonomous control. Um, you know, potentially that's my belief that first microreactor that comes out will be semi-autonomous, but not completely autonomous. Um, so there would be some human intervention required. But as we as we reach to the end of a kind of a microreactor in development, we would reach autonomous control. Uh, next area, as I mentioned, is the technology maturation in which 
basically uh, has four different objectives. Satisfying the R&D needs for existing developers. So we are talking to the vendors and developers in these technology, looking at and understanding high heat pipe performance and uh, high temperature moderator. In the next, I'm going to go and talk about the moderator's importance. Uh, next thing is demonstrating the assembly process to enable factory manufacturing. As you can imagine, we are looking into some unconventional ways of manufacturing things or fabricating things. When I say conventional, I mean advanced manufacturing. Um, so then we look into sensor embedments so basically can understand what's happening within the material itself while it's going through uh, some heat duty or thermal cycling. Uh, development of next generation systems. Uh, we talked about advancing heat exchangers. So conventional kind would be shell and tube, which is wide experience in industry, but we're looking into compact heat exchangers, which are like printed circuit heat exchangers, for example. Enabling future microactive applications, successful operation development of technology. Now, um, the microreactor in general comprises the following, following materials, fuel, for, for example, he high temperature moderator material, heat transfer power conversion, structure material, reflector, control materials, and instrumentation and sensors. Moderator plays a key role, basically, want to make sure that we are able to achieve the criticality in a smaller uh, footprint. Um, to do that in a safe manner. So, uh, and also making sure that the fuel we use is low enriched. So moderator has a really key function. Other things are talked about the heat transfer power conversion unit. We're generating heat. So we need to make sure that we have ways such as heat pipe, thermal device to get rid of the heat from the source to the sink. So we study those things and um, look for better effective uh, heat transfer measures. One of the things that uh, we achieved last year is looked at the high temperature moderator, yttrium hydride. Uh, there was not much information available in this in literature. So this is something very novel and unique, which came out of the program. This is the first time that anybody has done radiation testing for this material, because we see um, a lot of benefit in the material and a lot of vendors have shown interest. So we are currently doing radiation test experiment at, um, at the ATR at 600, 700, 800 degrees Celsius and followed by PIE. So uh, to understand um, more about this material and see if we this could be utilized as one of the moderator materials that you're planning to. One of the key things you wanna understand is hydrogen migration, which uh, basically uh, increases. The hydrogen tends to leave at much higher temperature, it permeates through materials. So we wanna understand if we can retain hydrogen in this, uh, what are the concentration of hydrogen we can retain and uh, so those sort of mechanisms we'll be understanding more once we have the test results from the ATR. So this is one of the big novel thing that program has produced. So really proud of that. Um, this is again an effort which was led by Atlano. Um, I talked about unconventional techniques. So we are looking at uh, test articles that are being advanced, you know, looking at advanced manufacturing to manufacture these. So we carried, I'm going to talk about the test facilities in a few slides. So the first test article that we are going to be testing is seven whole article, single heat pipe. So look at one of these blocks. These are six inches, 12 inches to a meter. And in the center, I don't know if you can see my point, the center would be the heat pipe surrounded by six cartridge heaters. So we'll test that. And then eventually we would have a 37 heat pipe article, which would be 75 kilowatt test article, which we'll be testing in a facility called Magnet. Um, one of the things we found out, which uh, came as a challenge. So when we this, uh, when we made this block, as you can see on the right, using advanced manufacturing, to maintain the tolerances throughout, to maintain tolerances from the top to bottom was a very challenging task. And um, so that basically that was a learning experience. So what we did is we divided these sections, as you can see in this middle figure, in, sep you know, in basic three inches block, and then we can diffusion bond these to achieve the, re the required geometry that we want as one of the alternate solutions. Um, other things we're looking into is power conversion unit. So uh, thanks to Sandia, we got the C30, which is 30 kilowatt electric PCU unit that we'll be testing in Magnet. Next year, this year, we just did our initial preliminary testing um, design study to see what needs to be achieved to make sure this coupling happens. Um, so we just did that, and next year we'll be looking into coupling this with a facility called Magnet. Instrumentation sensor becomes very important part of this because, as I said, to really understand what's happening within the test article uh, and you're getting the required information from them, the 
sensors and information becomes very important. So we are, what we're doing is we are using uh, commonly used instrumentation like thermocouples, RTDs for temperature measurements, uh, pressure transducer for pressure measurements, but we also are embedding sensors, as you can see in this figure in the center. So basically that'll give us two things. Once uh, this will give us cross verification data for these sensors, which have a low TRL level. When I say TRL, I really mean technology readiness level. So we don't have too much information for these sensors to really uh, confidently saying, will they be, will they work as they are supposed to in the, in the environment they're being exposed to? So by having these sensors also uh, embedded and uh, having our sensors like thermocouples that we really rely on and understand and have seen their work, this gives us, okay, if they don't work, what was the failure mechanism? What led to the failure? Can we modify the material of the embedded sensor to make sure they can work better? So that's what's happening in this. And then we are looking into not only uh, structure, but I mean stuff, we're also looking at strain. So the plot here basically shows uh, another thing we're looking at digital image correlation for structural integrity. As you can imagine, when these pieces go at 600, 700, 800 degrees Celsius and thermal cycle, you know, the structural integrity uh, could be compromised. So really to understand what's happening in the structure or we do DIC, uh, basically it's a um, speckled pattern that is that we put on the test article and we look at the expansion behavior. How does it expand? Um, and and study the strain measurement and get, gather the data and compare that with strain gauges. So, uh, you know, as I said, we always, wherever possible, gather as much data as possible and cross verify our measurement techniques with the more conventional kind. So in this, in this section, the main conclusion was, um, you know, taking maturation research aims to advance areas such as, I talked about the moderator, metallic fuels and structure materials, we're looking at different uh, code cases for like, such as grade 91 stainless steel. Uh, successful experiments were observed from yttrium hydride, which are recently performed. And we are currently doing experiments at ATR. And uh, we always keep our vendor, vendors informed and get their input to understand the future needs and desires of technology. Now, the next area that I'm heading up at INL is demonstration support capabilities under Microdata Pro overview. In this, as I mentioned, there are two aspects to it. One is the non-nuclear testing demonstration, uh, which has two facilities. One is FAIR, which is a single primary heat extraction removal emulator, primarily focused on understanding the characteristic and performance of heat pipes. The other one is Microactor Agile non-nuclear experiment test pad, which is the magnet. And the next one is a nuclear test pad, which is MARVEL. So these are two things which falls under this demonstration support capability area. As the word suggests, it's a demonstration. So here we basically uh, leverage what we learn from the technology maturation and implement it and uh, do required experiments and gather data to support verification and validation effort uh, undergoing um, and the other DOE programs also. And here I would like to acknowledge uh, other, other labs that are involved in this, Los Alamos and Oak Ridge National Lab. And here's a team at INL which is working with me uh, in this area. Now, the first facility I'm going to talk briefly about is single primary heat extraction and removal emulator sphere facility. So sphere, uh, basically, as I mentioned, is to understand the steady state and transient behavior of a heat pipe. There's a lot of information available on heat pipe because heat pipes are used by NASA, has been used by NASA for a long time, and uh, we have gathered a lot of information. In fact, uh, some of the computers used uh, the heat pipes to cool, um, you know, because they are a passive device to cool stuff. And they, they work in isothermal, they work very isothermally. So basically the temperature, what I expect at the evaporator end is almost similar as what I'm going to the condenser end. The challenge what comes with the heat pipe is not much information is available starting from the solid side, like when you have alkali metal. So what happens with the heat pipe is imagine there's a thermal, um, the pipe which has three sections to it, which has evaporator, adiabatic, and a condenser region. And then basically you have vapor which flows underneath uh, in the middle section, the vapor core region. And then it goes back to the evaporator using a wick material. So, uh, but again, under understanding how that heat transfer occurs, do we have, and mostly what it uses alkali metal like, such as sodium, lithium, cesium, potassium, uh, for high temperature heat pipe. Uh, those, are those, those are commonly used materials. 
but they need some temperature, for example, 97 degrees Celsius or so for making sure sodium is in a liquid state. So now making sure that code understands that and doesn't take that uh, the, uh, the alkali metals in molten state, right? So it has to start from solid, need to understand the melting front, need to understand the how does the melting occur and, um, and the boiling phenomena. So it's, it's a pretty, it's a complicated thing. So we need to make sure we have experiment to support those things. That's why I said steady state and transient and looking at startup instabilities. So we, uh, in this facility, try to accomplish that. Um, we did our initial startup and operation. This facility is for 20 kilowatt. The temperature maximum we can attain is 10 degrees Celsius. And um, we have access to inert gas such as helium, argon. But the initial test we did was in vacuum. Currently, we are conducting a gap conductance testing for NRC to understand the gap conductance behavior. And uh, once the data gets available, that'll be available um, for industries and vendors also. As I said, the main purpose for this facility is verification validation, supporting heat pipe testing, and also looking at initial testing before we go to magnet with the instrumentation and controls. So let me go back here. So if we look at the test article, this is what I was saying, the seven core block, where you have heat pipe in the center and six cartridge heaters. Uh, so this is the block which I talked about. Um, this is a thermal well which goes under the I have a slide which goes into it, but they have a thermal well which goes inside this heat pipe to make sure we can get the temperature distribution, axial temperature distribution uh, within the heat pipe. Um, this figure, basically, this uh, uh, video here just shows how the heat pipe really works. So basically, we heat the block with cartridge heaters. After it, uh, after it attains certain temperature we're interested in, you can see uh, basically the heat from the heat block or the test block goes all the way to the heat pipe isothermally. So what I mean isothermally is constant temperature. On the up figure, you on the above figure, you see a vacuum valve and purge valve. And these are the location where we have thermocouple uh, to get the temperature information. So when we model, we can compare the data and model and do our uh, verification validation. The maximum power rating is 10 kilowatt um, for this setup. And this one is the same setup. We have access to helium and argon that use as a coolant gases. We use that to cool uh, our heat block. And then we here we have flow meter and delta T where we can look at uh, the sensible heat equation, um, just uh, M dot CP delta T and look at the, and basically that ensures us to make sure that we can cross verify the heat input and heat output. That gives us one more way to understand if you're able to get rid of the heat that is being supplied. So, okay. Uh, so, okay, this is the more figures in the facility. One other good thing when we design this facility is we can do this um, operation at different angles. So what I mean by that is we can do it horizontally or we can also uh, manipulate or change the fixture so we can do this uh, testing at an angle. The first experiment we did uh, for this was single ACT heat pipe. Um, they provide us a heat pipe, which is just one kilowatt. One of the limitation of the facility is based on the heat pipe removal capability. So with the heaters, we can go at much higher rate heat removal rating. But as we just started this experiment, this facility just came online last December. So we only done uh, shakedown testing and we currently are performing the gap conductance testing. So with experimental facilities, you want to make sure you take kind of baby steps. So we started with the lower performing heat pipe to make sure that we are able to first um, get the data we require, understand INC is working as it's supposed to, and that, that became our shakedown testing, so which was done successfully. How do we know we got done successfully? Because we had um, data which was provided by the vendors, as you can see on the left, and we were able to generate the same data um, from our testing. When we overlaid it, it laid pretty well. So we found out that yes, uh, we are able to get to the temperatures or uh, the data matched uh, pretty well with the vendors, providing us confidence in our testing capability for the sphere facility. Currently, we are looking at the gap conductance testing, as I mentioned, and different orientation heat pipe experiments. Now, so that's a small scale facility. Now we're going to a uh, the larger scale facility, which has a rating of 250 kilowatt, design pressure of 2.2 MPa or 22 bar. And this basically, as you can imagine, there are a lot of micro reactor concepts uh, out there. 
So you want to make sure that we have a test bed that can meet uh, thermal hydraulic needs for most of them. So that's why we put this facility together. As much as possible, we'll do a low fidelity test at a sphere first before we bring that in magnet. So we understand the conditions, we understand what's required, um, especially for the test article and for the INC. So um, before we bring it into magnet. So in this, as you can see, I don't know if you, if you can see this, they have uh, veins outside, which basically gives access to cold chill water. So we can go above 750 degrees Celsius if you really have to, but this rating of 750 degrees Celsius is limited to the cooling mechanism that we have, which is mainly depending on the gas flow. Um, basically, uh, gas flow, when I say ga in gas, I mean inert gas like uh, helium, um, helium, argon, and the mixture. So this just talks about the objectives as I talk about as a general purpose, non-nuclear test bed to basically ensure we can do thermal hydraulic and material testing to support V and B needs. Uh, flow loop design to 60 degrees Celsius, pressure of 22 bar, and we can get up to the vacuum of 10 to minus 4 tor. We're using PXI based data acquisition control from national instruments or a DAC system. And um, the data gathered here would enhance readiness of public stakeholders, support and leverage of the DOE programs, and uh, provide information for NRC. So to support licensing activities for micro reactors. This is a PFD diagram, the process flow diagram. This is where my magnet, which is an which is a essentially an environmental or vacuum chamber. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we have recuperated heat exchanger, which basically ensures um, that you know it heats up that gases before it goes to the magnet. And then I have access to an, by another heat exchanger, I have access to a chiller, which goes outside the building. Um, which maintains the temperature. So this is a commonly used chiller between two facilities, TEDS and Magnet. This is what we have so far. In future, we are, in future meaning FI22, which is next year, we are uh, thinking of integrating this to the power conversion unit. As I mentioned uh, briefly that we have carried out initial preliminary design already for this. Um, so once that is approved, we will be coupling this with PCU going forward. The different lines here, different colors, basically shows the temperature. So red is 650, yellow is 300, and the blue is 60 degrees Celsius. So this is a big setup. This took us almost a year to uh, complete. And uh, there were some delays, um, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, the procurement delays, uh, which did delay a few of the milestones, but uh, we were able, still able to carry out some preliminary shakedown testing. In December 2021, we went to 12 bar, and then in January, we went to 20 bar. And then uh, in March, we completed pneumatic test and inspection of all welded joints at the pressure and temperature. So as you can imagine, and for this big complex facility, we gotta make sure that um, you know we don't um, hurry up into doing a testing. We have to uh, do like a baby step to get to the pressure, to get to the temperature, to make sure the wells behave, they're supposed to, INC is behaving the way it's supposed to. So uh, we have confidence when we do our testing. This is how it's uh, laid out. So this is our environmental channel, the magnet. It's next to a facility called TEDS, which is Thermal Energy Distribution System. It's basically energy storage testing facility. The two, the two tanks that you see is just a Thermonol 66. It's a surrogate for molten salt. Um, that we use, so it's a synthetic oil. Um, basically, this is basic to understand the energy storage. It's a packed bed energy storage performance. Down the road, uh, the reason to co-locate it with magnet is we would want to study the behavior, coupled behavior of these two uh, systems together and understand, um, as I said, thermal cycling behavior. Next to it, and on the top is expansion tank. Anyway, the next to it, HTAC, which is high temperature steam electrolysis. It's a 25 kilowatt unit, it's operational. It generates hydrogen uh, from steam electrolysis. That potentially could be a load to the system. So we want to understand um, when my reactor is subjected to these sort of loads, how does it behave? So having it co-located really um, gives us a lot of uh, benefit that you cannot really get by modeling. You know, some, some things are, um, you know, modeling is important. Of course, we did modeling initially. But once we learn from modeling, we implement that in an experiment and vice versa. Once we learn from experiment, we go back to modeling and try to focus on a few things that uh, you know 
are still an unknown or you want to know more about. So it goes hands in hand, both modeling and experiment goes hand in hand with each other. Uh, look, you know, so I want to show you some real um, hardware pictures. Um, this is how the facility looks. I'm sorry, it's a pretty busy slide, but this is how it is. So we have DEDS, we have this the magnet facility. This is our uh, high dimensional electrolysis facility. Then here we have some EV vehicle charging stations. So it's, it's a pretty good integrated system lab where we have different uh, loads or different energy systems that can be coupled uh, and will be coupled down the road. So this is just more figures. Now the question always comes, okay, this is all good, but what can and where can industry leverage from all this? So as I mentioned, initially we have uh, this, the sphere facility where we have heat pipe thermal performance, where you can get startup and shutdown, which will give us the characteristic and behavior of heat pipe. So we can do that for the vendors, give them the data, provide them a capability that they might not have. Uh, one of the things that, uh, what came, came across as a concern is cascading failure. So what happens is in a bigger test article, like 75 kilowatt, you have 37 heat pipes. So now, for example, if one of the heat pipes fail, how does that impact the neighboring heat pipe? Can it lead to cascading failure? Uh, is there something we can do to avoid that? Or does it really happen? So studying that, we'll be doing that in Magnet because it has to be done at a scale that sphere cannot be used. So Magnet will come in handy to you for that testing. High temperature and pressure testing. For gas electric components, we are looking at you know, much higher pressure and temperatures. Um, and most of the facilities out there can uh, achieve either or, so they can go to higher temperature but not pressure, or higher pressure but not have that high temperature. Whereas our facility that we designed, we kept that in mind. So we can do a component testing at high pressure and temperature to meet that need. Certainly working with instrumentation control, as I said, that's a really upcoming field because um, we, if you really want to understand what's happening inside a test article, we need to have enough data, enough confidence in our embedded sensors. So um, before you use it in, in, a, in a real case, we want to use it in other cases that we can embed that, embed those sensors in where we have conventional techniques. So we understand how did that sensor behave? Uh, if it failed, what was the reason of the failure? And is it something maybe we can look in different materials? For further enhancement of sensors, make a sensor of different material that can withstand the much higher temperatures so they don't fail or give higher probability of success. Sometimes you want to take it all the way to the failure happens to see, okay, what is the failure limit for a particular sensor? Um, other thing that we support is verification validation. All this data that we generate from these facilities can directly apply to uh, VNV for codes. Uh, when I say codes, I mean modeling tools out there and certainly uh, provide the required data to enhance the technical readiness levels for these components. Because what happens is we have a component which has maybe operation data for much, like maybe just one or two data points at much low pressure or temperature. So we don't have confidence would it behave um, similarly or effectively in higher pressure and temperature. So while carrying out this testing, we generate data which can provide the information required to enhance the TRL levels. Next thing is the interface and coupling. Um, you know, if we basically look at one component at a time, like heat exchanger itself, and design it and make sure it works, that's fine. But when you couple it with different systems, how does it behave? Um, when we thermal cycle it, uh, how does the diffusion bonded uh, heat exchangers behave? Does the bonding degrade or stays? Um, you know, what is the lifetime? So all those things is very hard to get from the vendor because they don't have the capability to do all those sort of testing for a particular component. So we can do that and uh, generate data. And then of course, looking at different uh, mediums uh, for power conversion, like supercritical CO2. We have a lot of information on ranking cycle, uh, data at high pressure or low pressure, water systems, uh, but not so much for supercritical CO2 or helium Brayton cycle. So we can generate that. And understanding design margins, how much margins do we have ensuring that we still stay in a safety region, how much design margins do we have in the component design, which can lead to uh, more economic um, solutions. So, you know, as I said, we always look at, of course, technical aspect is very important, but we cannot disregard the economic aspects because they go, they gotta go in hand in hand. Uh, you know, in summary for what I just talked about for code, we have a code called Air Wolf we're using, which involves Sakai which is a heat pipe, or you can take it as a thermal hydraulics code, 
for understanding heat by performance. Bison is another moose tool which looks into fuel performance. Uh, Mammoth looks into reactive physics and depletion. And then we have other codes which are coupled with structure. So why is this important? So if you look at codes out there, right, like which are commercially available, they have one aspect of this. They, it's hardly, I've never come across a code which can basically take into structural information and provide the information to thermal, thermal to fuel, fuel to um, reactive physics or depletion, and then they're all connected. Uh, so basically we need the whole figure. We need the whole information from all aspects to really understand what's happening in the reactor. So now uh, there, there's some work under DOE NEMS program, which is going to support this. And uh, in Sphere, we did our shakedown testing in December. We're looking at gap conductance right now and working very closely with NEMS program. So this is just what I was talking about, just an example, uh, how the tool would behave. So this basically shows a coupling between a thermal tool and the fuel tool. So, you know, just coupling example for those two. And you can imagine things will get more complicated as we have other tools also providing feedback and inputs to this. Uh, you know, so uh, again, application, they use Mammoth, Bison, Sakai, looking at steady state, but again, want to get to transient. And, um, uh, you know, this is just a runtime hour for this coupling. In Magnet, um, as I talked about, this is what we got going. Uh, it's really interesting time because we are doing testing uh, of really novel things out there. Getting some information is, um, you know, just first-hand information. There's not much to compare in literature. And that's what makes research interesting. Um, so looking at that, looking at failures, what, how can we make the system better, enhance the efficiency and effectiveness? Um, so right now, after completing the demonstration initial startup, we are looking into a single heat pipe test article, which will occur maybe a couple of weeks. And then uh, next year, we would be integrating a power conversion unit with Magnet. And then following year, we'll be doing the testing. So I talked about non-nuclear testing. Now taking a next step to nuclear testing. So this is being a, this is a project called Marvel. I'm sure some folks might have heard about this. It's called Micro Application Research Validation Evaluation Project. This is uh, being supported by MRP Micro Program and Enric. They're two different DOE programs. Uh, what would this enable us is help us in micro integration, remote power and heat for computing water and buildings. So basically, um, once we gather information from non-nuclear testing, we can apply that to nuclear testing. And as you can imagine, nuclear, thing, nuclear testing is much more expensive and much more involved. So, um, so that's why we have laid out these steps. But again, the work is going on simultaneously. So it's not like we're depending on one to finish before other one proceeds. This is a unit which has four Stirling engines. We have a lot of information on Stirling engines um, available, which has been used. So we're using most of things in this jack is off the shelf. Uh, this 100 kilowatt normal electric plus 20 kilowatt electric uses natural circulation with sodium potassium eutectic as a coolant. When we talk about eutectic, most the main reason to, you, to use eutectic is to bring down the melting temperature for the coolant while keeping the same sort of thermal um, uh, performance attributes. The fuel that we're considering is uh, uranium zirconium hydride. Reactivity control is four drums, as you see on the figure. And each drum would um, basically rotate um, on its own, have its own motor. So that way, um, we basically provide more robustness and resilience to the design. This is located, this is a pit at the treat facility, which I talked in the initial slide, which is restart. So um, this is where it will be located. And since the facility is already uh, has all the required information for nuclear grade stuff, so that did uh, speed up the process. Okay, so um, in conclusion, you know, we have exciting challenges ahead in this uh, microreactor arena. We are still um, all on, on a daily basis looking at innovative ideas to drive down the cost. Successful demonstration, that is the key. Demonstrate, demonstrate, demonstrate. Successful demonstration are needed to gain utility, regulate and public confidence so that we can support our tools, um, answer the unknowns that we have, re reduce the uncertainty that the models or tools have uh, so we can uh, demonstrate and deploy, uh, deploy these microreactors in the next three to five years. For more information, what's happening on uh, this program, we have this website and we have the information sheet, which are called fact sheets, which talks about these facilities in just two pages. 
that if somebody's interest, I would strongly encourage them to read those if there's interest. And um, we have technical reports and papers uh, or manuscripts that we produce always go there and they're available for general public to take a look at. And um, so, you know, SMRs or microreactors can assure energy security, economic prosperity with reduction in emissions in a sustainable manner for decades to come. So are they important? Certainly. And but are we bold enough and uh, innovative enough to tackle this challenge? And the time is now. So, you know, we we like to see them coming up, um, you know, being deployed next to our grid soon, or maybe at an industrial plant, meeting steel need or paper 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 board needs for thermal or electric electricity need. Because as I, I mentioned, you know, that's one way, or that is, I think, one of the most prominent way to reduce emissions in a sustainable manner going forward. So with that, uh, firstly, I'd like to credit and acknowledge USDOE, NE program, INL, uh, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, and Argo National Lab, because as I said, this is a joint effort between various labs. And with that, I'll be happy to take on any questions. Thank you. Bayush, thank you. That was, that's great. There's a lot of uh, information there. And I'll go ahead and give some time if anybody wants to type out some questions or if you'd like to come on and ask one. Uh, while we're doing that, I have a question for you, Payush. Sure. Uh, you know, just having been, you know, to, to a nuclear reactor site previously, uh, with this, I'm wondering, is the low yield enrichment or the low lower enrichment, is that allowing for less concern over the long-term um, of the materials being used? Because I know that's like a big thing. You have to make sure that if we put this together, it's not gonna, you know, defend right. or, or something. Right, so so before I answer that, I'm gonna say a couple, more, one more thing. As a disclaimer, you know, what I presented is just my views, my perspective, nothing to do with INL or DOE's vision. And my answers, again, are my opinion, you know, in my perspective. So yeah, the low enriched uranium, you know, basically there are two things, what I, you know, look at. If I can use low enriched uranium, I am basically reducing the non-proliferation concern, right? That's that's another big one. Secondly, depending on the fuel, right, my radioactive waste concentration is going to be low, right, because it's a low enriched uranium that I use as a fuel. So those are the key benefits, right? That's why there's a lot of effort going into conversion from HU to LEU, and um, so yeah. And when you say non-proliferation, um... yeah. Just like I know you go to a, a nuclear reactor, there's armed guards everywhere. Um, so you, when you say non-proliferation, you mean somebody doesn't come in and steal the thing, right? Correct, correct. I mean, yeah, they're, <laughs> even, even, if they, even if they are able to, which I highly doubt they can, but even if they're able to, they still do not have enough, um, you know, for any other usages. So Like, like a weapons usage or something of that nature. Okay. Yeah. Um, Reed has a question you put in chat. Uh, asking if this would have applications in space. I know some of the other nuclear programs have already been used in space, but uh, perhaps like a SpaceX Starship going to Mars. Right, right. Certainly we have. I mean, um, you know, they use, um, uh, they have used like radio uh, radioisotope as a source for space exploration. And I talked about it's We leverage from each other's technology, right? So what I mean by that is like um, in space, we would like this to be autonomous. Right. And basically things that we learn here can be applied there. So we have a lot of programs that we work directly with NASA. Right. Of course, I can go in details on those or what are we looking at. But uh, like heat, for example, you know, it's a technology that NASA has used. We have enough confidence in. But what we are testing is beyond the limit or novel heat pipes that we don't have much understanding on, which can enhance the performance. You know, both terrestrial, I mean, um, and in space. So. And then Sarah has a question. Where do you see the nuclear technology going to in the next decade? So again, being a nuclear proponent and being a nuclear professional, I really want, you know, see, I take it as this. I want to give people and folks, everybody facts, you know, tell them the true statements, tell them what's really happening, what's, and then let them make the decision. You know, that's always been my philosophy. So what I foresee is, you know, really addressing the clean energy goals, to really make sure that we can reduce the emissions. The only way possible in a resilient manner is nuclear. Other, other, other energy mixes have their role, 
but nuclear has such a prominent and big role because uh, you know the way the way the technology works we just have negligible emissions and those emissions come from the life cycle analysis of the material we use right like steel structure material all those things but in our process right we do not generate co2 right so uh, so that's the thing to really attain carbon free to get to the more sustainable uh, goals i think nuclear has a really big role and i really hope everybody sees that that's why the study was done for top 14 industries which already has infrastructure available like steel has been you been been you know steel cement lime you name it they have in the, they have requirement of heat and electricity on a daily basis i was surprised to see how much amount of heat uh paper industry needs you know so basically if you can deploy one of these plants we can really replace so many of the boilers you know in a most efficient manner you know so for sure and it's amazing too because the heat is a byproduct of creating the electricity so with the traditional nuclear reactor you have to you're trying to control that right in a traditional one you're trying to prevent like a meltdown um but with what you're talking about it's creating the electricity but using that heat as instead of just a byproduct that you have to deal with it's a byproduct that's going towards something and is doing some sort of right. process industrial so, process there, there are two ways to look at it one is uh, like waste heat usage right so basically that heat that you use from different stages of turbine that you can use second what i'm saying is think about this right before electricity is produced from a generator we have turbo machinery before it goes through before i use that in a power conversion unit it's basically steam it's hot steam before it goes to the turbines so if i use that steam as a source i can divert it you know i have a valve or something i can divert the energy if i don't need it to a plant use that heat need and then when i need it back i can divert it back and generate electricity have that sort of thing so i have two products so i look more economically attractive not only electricity but a, a heat market too so and then uh, craig has a question um uh, about your thoughts on the disposal of the exhausted fuel uh, cells or the exhausted fuel rods i guess they would be right so yeah i mean depending on you know like there are some ways if you close the fuel cycle can we do that and certainly we can do that and there are some microelectric companies are talking about that one secondly of course um, some of this will go as high level waste right we'll do a best to recover what we can otherwise they would go as a normal route but micro reactor is such a small capacity reactor that you already reduce things you know um and uh, you know you basically you have a customer need you basically say okay this micro reactor will fit in best there and use it for 10 years or so and then um, you know if you can recycle recycle or otherwise it'll go to the high level waste repository um are you sure curious uh, are you familiar with um a project i think it's a saudi prince uh, a city called the line the line no yeah it's this brilliant idea to create a um, basically an underground infrastructure to transfer your transportation needs to put in all of your uh, you know electrical wiring things like that and the idea is that everybody that lives in the city has no need for a vehicle they can simply walk the the grocery store is 5 minutes away the school is 5 minute walk away etc but when you first started off with the desalination plant the first thing in my mind was you could drop one of these almost anywhere in the world next to the ocean right provide electricity to create an entire town and also provide the clean water because i know that's a concern as everybody's looking at the water levels too right of what we're right. getting right right i mean uh, certainly see we are, i mean as i said we provide heat i mean micro grid provide heat and electricity so desalination looking at multi stage flashing or even reverse osmosis we can certainly do that and there is a big need like talking about you talk about oceans and stuff so like naval submarines right they are essentially uh, you know nuclear submarines are essentially a micro reactor in ocean you know so um yeah awesome looks like we got a couple more just comments um thank you interesting stuff great job so any other questions and, and one more thing like as i mentioned the website that we keep it up to date pretty frequently you know things that maybe i went to fast on if they have any question please feel free to reach out to me 
um, you know, or go to the website. I'll be, um, you know, just an email away. Anytime you have a question, just feel free to reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to do my best. Awesome. Well, I guess that will conclude it then. I don't see any more questions. Um, I know I find it highly interesting, especially the long-term economics and, and everything we've seen over this last summer. Um, you know, we, we need to look at solutions. So really appreciate it. Sounds good. Thanks, David. Thank, thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend coming up.